Good morning. Uh, this is Jim Adams, Superintendent of Schools. I want to thank you for joining me on this webinar uh, with regard to uh, school reopening in the fall of 2020 for the Ashland Public Schools. And what I hope to do is give you just a, an outline of where we are today uh, on July 16th, 2020, uh, where we're headed in the future and how these things coincide with uh, recommendations from the state level, the Department of Education, uh, the governor's office, uh, the work that's being done with uh, local uh, unions, uh, as well as uh, the state unions, et cetera. Uh, before we begin, I just want to make sure that everyone can hear me. Uh, you should be able to raise your hand. Uh, if you can, just raise your hand. Perfect. Looks like you can. Um, and I will lower them all. Thank you. Uh, logistically, there's also a Q&A section uh, that where you can pose some questions, and you'll notice a a thumbs up sign on the left hand side. It's on my left hand side, so I'm just describing it. If you want to hit that button, what it does is if you're reading the questions and, and you find this to be a question that you'd really like answered, if you hit the thumbs up, it, it automatically will move the question that is most um, pertinent or uh, on people's minds the most. It'll move to the top of the list so we can ensure that we get those questions answered today as well. Um, the Video here is being recorded by WACA. It's being live streamed as well. Uh, it's on the education channel. So um, there is limited, there are a limited number of, of enrollees because of the program itself. So I have added uh, two more uh, webinars on uh, Sunday morning at 8 a.m. and uh, next Tuesday uh, as well at 8 a.m. So uh, for folks who are watching this and who want to have uh, questions asked then uh, and couldn't get into this, um, webinar, um, please join me there. I did resend a link this morning uh, as the email I sent yesterday, the link defaulted back to uh, today's uh, and tonight's uh, webinars. So uh, again, thank you for, for taking the time and, and hopefully we can um, answer some questions and, and, um, and go from there. But uh, first and foremost, thank you uh, again to families and, and educators and parents and um, the community members for doing uh, the hard work of keeping everyone safe and uh, know that every decision that we are going to make is first and foremost about faculty, student, family, um, administration, uh, their well-being and their health. And as we look at data and we follow the data, uh, we will uh, certainly keep that at the forefront of all decision making. Um, as, as to how we open up school and what it will look like in the future. I, I would wish I could give you definitive answers, um, but I can't uh, for everything. So let me just start by, by walking you through where we are uh, today. So on June 25th, um, the Commissioner of Education sent out to all communities some initial guidance on, on what school reopening could look like. And in that guidance, he presented three options that each school district had to uh, investigate or what he was calling a feasibility study. Uh, and the first option was uh, full in-person learning with the caveat that desks um, could be a minimum of three feet with the ideal of six feet of space apart. All students grades two through 12 uh, and educators, uh, adults in the, in the buildings were to be wearing masks uh, seats were facing the exact same way. Um, and, you know, basically business as usual, if you will. Um, not that I could ever imagine that would be business as usual. Uh, but that was sort of, that's the layout, right? So each district had to go through their buildings. Uh, and this is what we've been doing over the past two weeks is going into classrooms, setting up mock classrooms, if you will, to see if we can actually fit um, the required amount of desk in order uh, in a way that allows for um, three feet minimum of physical distancing to occur. The second option um, that we have to discuss is a hybrid model of learning, which means uh, it means different things for different communities. But to, to keep it simple, it's if we have in-person and remote learning um, you know, online learning or other forms of learning outside of the building, what does that look like? 
Does it look like an every other day approach? So half the kids come on Monday, half the kids come on Tuesday, maybe half the, or another example might be half the kids come for a week and the other half come for another, for the, in the next week. So those kids who are at home for the first week are doing remote learning. So that's sort of, that's the hybrid mix uh, in what uh, is meant by the hybrid model. Uh, again, it's, it, I'm giving you the high, um, high view of what that looks like in terms of the logistics, it's very challenging. Uh, the remote piece is just that, it's remote learning, no kids are in schools, uh, everything is done um, you know, outside of the school building. And those are the three options uh, that we were presented with as a, um, as a district, but also across the Commonwealth by the commissioner. All of that information uh, that we gather in the feasibility phase, if you will, uh, is due to the commissioner on July 31st. And what I wanna make sure that folks understand is one of the major differences uh, with this guidance um, and where it deviates a little bit from uh, guidelines of the CDC was the CDC has been, um, you know, talking about school reopenings at six feet of physical distancing. This plan that was sent forth by the uh, Department of Education was you six feet is, is what we're looking for, but three to six feet is fine with other mitigating factors like folks wearing masks, um, you know, things of that nature. So what I wanna say is um, all of this, these decisions uh, with regard to what school will look like in terms of a full in-person, a hybrid or remote uh, will eventually become a school committee decision. Uh, we have five working groups, and so one in each building uh, from pre-K through 12 who are working through uh, logistics of their own buildings because each building has very different uh, setup. Uh, how would you physically distance in the hallway? What would that look like in terms of, um, you know, lunch services, um, physical education, music classes, art classes, all of them, all of the buildings have different avenues uh, that need, need to be taken. Uh, what drop off, pick up uh, from parents to transportation of buses, what does that look like? Um, there are still many things uh, that are unanswered at the state level. Transportation is one of them. Are we only allowed to have one person per seat or one every other seat? Uh, that information should be forthcoming uh, in the next week from the Department of Education. Um, but what I can tell you is one thing they did say is everyone will be wearing uh, mass. Um, then on August 10th, we have to have finalized plans, meaning what are we going to do uh, to open up school in Ashland or in any other community um, submitted to the state of Massachusetts and approved by our school committee. Uh, that's a lot of work to be done, to be honest, in 10 days. To, and, and I and other superintendents have been pushing the Department of Ed to say, we need decisions to be made at that state level so we can make decisions to help our families out. They need to know what's going to happen uh, in, in the fall. They need to understand if we're going to a hybrid model, what does that look like? And how does it impact um, their own working conditions uh, and, and assisting their children uh, in some you know, of the remote learning aspects? What does it look like if it's clearly just remote? Again, how are we going to assist families uh, you know, in the childcare needs, uh, things of that nature. So all of that stuff is due on the 10th. Um, and I, and I, I know one of the questions that, that came about um, on this thread, but I had written it down even before the question was, uh, where do the unions stand and what does it look like at the, at the state level and the national level with our, with our educator unions and nurses unions and custodial unions. And um, they're, there are so many um, players in this game that yes, we're, we're having conversations with all of them. I, I certainly think every state and every community has to look at COVID uh, in, um, in their own lens to a certain extent and regionally. So what's happening in Ashland is very specific to Ashland and how are we mitigating and how are we contact tracing? How are we um, putting into protocols um, and processes here uh, that may be different than um, Worcester, for instance. So because Worcester is doing something doesn't mean we shouldn't do something differently. Um, 
So we, so those are things that we just have to be thoughtful of. Um, but I can tell you that that our union um, uh, and I have been in contact the entire time. Um, in fact, you know, we're sitting down on Monday uh, to have conversations about the fall uh, and and what it could possibly look like. Much of this has to be bargained. Um, they have contracts. And uh, again, our number one priority is to make sure our, our students and our educators um, are in a safe environment uh, and that we're creating an environment that is safe for them. Um, I will go on record right now and state that I believe the three foot um, is not the right move. Um, I, I believe that when I've set up the classrooms and I look at three feet of distance, um, I can understand why there would be trepidation uh, when all other measures, CDC, but also we go into a grocery store, you go into uh, other avenues where there are um, numbers of people together and that six foot measure is what is a standard. Um, and I certainly think that a standard of six feet is where we probably need to begin uh, to have that conversation uh, within our classrooms uh, for the health and well-being of our students as well as our faculty. Um, we cannot discount the fact that we will have students and faculty and staff uh, who do have um, immunocompromised uh, systems. And we want to make sure that, that we are doing the best we can uh, to ensure their health and well-being and safety as well. So, um, so that is a question that was asked on the, on the chat as well, but I had written it down beforehand that we are in contact with our, um, with our union uh, and, and working with them uh, to make sure. So our nurses, I meet with our, our head nurse, Audrey LaCroix, um, every Monday morning uh, to, to, to ensure that all the proper equipment that is needed, uh, masks, um, you know, gowns, face shields, sanitizers, um, you know, soaps, anything that we need to ensure a safe environment um, is, is, is purchased. So she and I are meeting uh, every week to, to ensure this. Um, and, and I'll get into some of the logistics about uh, that piece of it uh, in a little bit. Um, so what I wanna do now, uh, that's just the, again, the high level, level overview of where we are. I wanna go through the questions. And what I did last time and I found uh, worked out well was I read the questions and, and provided the answers. These are the questions that were submitted online um, before the, the webinar. And then I will go through the, the questions uh, that, that are on the Q&A piece. And I, and I appreciate that. Uh, and hopefully we can, um, we'll be able to answer some of them and some of them may be um, duplicated here. So uh, let me start with that. Um, and, why don't you just give me a thumbs up if we're if we're good right now and, and, and we're ready to move on and you feel okay with that. Beautiful, great, thank you. Uh, you know, I'm still not used to everything being remote. I like being with people. So um, first question was, can you share the preliminary findings from the survey that was sent out recently regarding remote, hybrid and in-person options? Absolutely, and I have that data for you here. So let me say thank you again. Uh, this was survey number two to the community. Uh, survey number three will certainly be coming out probably in a week. And that survey will be specific to, uh, again, we have to look at all three models, but what if we went to a hybrid model? What would that look like or potentially could look like and how does the community uh, best respond to it? For example, um, would it be better for a community to have um, and I'm thinking about our, our parents as, as employees and, um, and our students in the classrooms and the connections with kids as well. But does it make sense to have a full week in and then a full week and a full week off? So half the group in and then half the group off. Or does it make sense for an every other day model? So half the group in on Monday, half in on Tuesday. Or does it make sense for a every two days um, have a group and then a, a, a full a disinfecting day, if you will, on the middle of the week or at the end of the week. So those are some options that from a hybrid standpoint, we'll be looking at and I'll be needing community feedback. Um, I want to express that there's no way we're going to meet the needs of every single family uh, in this community. Uh, we will do the best we can with what we have uh, and the resources that, that have been given to us. Uh, so your input is critically important. Uh, but I also recognize the fact that, that we will not be able to, to meet the needs of everyone. And, and I always use my own household with four different school districts. My wife teaches as one, I'm in one, 
and my two boys go to two different school districts. And uh, that's going to look very uh, interesting in our, in our household as well. So, um, but if we're doing what's in the best interest of our, of our students and faculty and staff, then I feel uh, that whatever decision we make is, is the right decision. So getting back to the, to the survey. So it asked uh, three questions most recently. Um, you know, option one was a full in-person uh, learning with, with safety requirements put in place. And the one thing of the safety requirements was uh, it didn't delineate between the three foot and the six foot. Uh, and and I'm, I did get emails from families saying, hey, Jim, if, you know, if it was three feet, I feel I would change my answer compared to the six foot, um, which is a fair, um, a fair assessment. Uh, option two was hybrid learning and option three was just remote learning. So option one, uh, we had uh, we had 1,375 um, families respond to this, uh, which is a good number. We have about 2,700 total, so 50% of the population uh, of kids, um, I say that, of families. So in-person learning on average was about 61% uh, of the folks said they want full in-person learning with safety requirements. Option two was the hybrid learning. 28% uh, of the folks said, uh, you know, we're only comfortable with, with hybrid learning. And then we had about 12% of our families say, listen, we want remote learning only and we're not sending our kids back until there's a vaccine or until we feel comfortable. And I, and I wanna highlight that point because uh, what hasn't been discussed within this community or many communities is uh, how will we approach those families that uh, are unwilling uh, to send their children back? Um, and that's a great question in itself because we have options, right? Families have options under Mass General Law. They can homeschool their own children where they then apply to the local school district um, for uh, the ability to homeschool. So they're responsible for all of the homeschooling of, of their children for the year uh, or for however long they feel comfortable doing it. Um, but with that comes, uh, I'll be, uh, you know, some paperwork. It comes with uh, making sure that curriculum and assessments are, are uh, approved by the school district, uh, et cetera. The other option is, do we as a school district create uh, a remote learning uh, academy, if you will, um, or opportunity for our students? Um, and that is what we're investigating. Uh, we also understand that we're going to have, we are going to have some faculty and staff um, that are also hesitant to come back for health reasons. And how do we best utilize them if they are possibly have um, the ability to uh, remote teach only? And can we marry them up, if you will, and match them up uh, with the students who might be, um, and families who might uh, not be willing to send their kids back? So for instance, if we have 20 third graders, uh, do we have a third grade teacher uh, who can only do, who will, will only do remote learning for third graders? Um, that's what we're working through. Uh, we're working through options and working through, you know, what it would take for, for bargaining with our, with our teachers union as well. Um, so all of these things are being considered. And like I said, uh, by, by August 10th, we have to have that um, in place. Um, I, would, I would say this, uh, I certainly is a goal is to have as many kids in our schools as possible. Um, but only doing so when it's safe and healthy for our kids. And I know there are arguments on all sides of, of, of the aisle here. Kids are less likely, the American Pediatric Association put out, you know, their support of a three, three to six foot, uh, saying how uh, younger kids are less likely to uh, transmit um, uh, COVID. Um, and so, but what does that look like? Um, you know, there's, you know, yesterday I was reading an article about, you know, pre-K through five, um, more likely to be able to go back um, versus, you know, full-time model, if you will, versus uh, nine, you know, six through 12, uh, where uh, older kids are, are more likely to carry the virus. Um, so, so, so it's complicated um, and quite complex. And we will, again, we're gonna continue to, to work through the data uh, and guidance and recommendations. Um, in school, is school going to be a combination of both remote and some in-person? Um, some in-person is so important for the personal connection to teachers and other students. Middle school ages need more specific instruction directly from the teacher on what is expected in each assignment, whether remote or in-person. 
Um, this tends to get lost in the remote setup. I, I stated this uh, in the first webinars series I did. Our remote learning is going to look totally different than it did in the spring. Um, it, we absolutely need to step it up. Uh, we absolutely need to have um, follow our curriculum, look at assessments, uh, have really high expectations of our students who are using remote learning. But to answer the question, more than likely, uh, there will be throughout this year a, a remote period uh, or a hybrid period. That there's no way we can probably get through the school year without not having at least uh, one of those um, models take place. Uh, I just don't see it happening. Thinking about um, some of the districts around the country who were going to open uh, in person have now gone to a hybrid or gone to a remote uh, because of an uptick in, in the cases. Um, again, I think we're a lot more vigilant uh, in Massachusetts uh, in, in the Northeast in particular than uh, many other places within the country. Uh, and again, that's why the commissioner and the governor has asked us to delay any decision-making on actual uh, plans. Uh, they wanna see the, the data uh, and the science uh, before we make any full decisions. Uh, in past meetings, you mentioned there may be a remote option for families. I just mentioned that. Uh, that information will probably be coming out next week. Um, I wanted to understand how many families uh, we were talking about uh, in terms of the uh, percentage um, of uh, that didn't feel comfortable coming back. To, and, and then we have to break it out by grade level. Uh, again, it looks very different at the high school um, because four different grade levels, but students are in different uh, levels of classes. Um, so they might be in an honors class or an, or an advanced pl placement class. They're taking seven courses and they're discipline specific. I may not have enough teachers uh, who are interested in doing just remote learning. So we're looking at platforms as is the state of Massachusetts, uh, learning platforms that, that would be, um, again, maybe a teacher or an administrator is, is monitoring students, but students in those um, who are 100% re remote might be, uh, you know, charged with, and families being charged with um, ensuring the students are doing the work. Uh, so we're investigating that. We're looking at the cost of those models uh, and to see uh, how we can how we can approach that. Um, if we return to some form of in-person school, will, will parents be able to opt, opt out? Again, same question. The answer is yes, that information will be coming. Um, I, my guess is, however, if you opt out, um, we will ask you to opt out for a long period of time, um, whether it's a half a year or the full year. Those are discussions that we're still uh, having internally. Um, if we return to online learning, will activities be similar to the spring? No, uh, they will certainly be uh, much more robust. Uh, will the district consider adhering to the CDC six foot social distancing recommendation rather than the less supported three foot? Uh, I just mentioned at the beginning, absolutely. I, I, am, uh, I am in favor of, of looking at six feet as being our, um, uh, our guideline, our standard. Um, will there be partitions between the desks? Good question. Um, and depending upon classrooms and needs, uh, there could be. Uh, we've also been advised that the partitions between desks require very specific cleaning as well uh, and more, um, more time with, with our custodial and maintenance uh, staff uh, on a daily basis to ensure that those are clean. Um, but we do have some partitions depending upon uh, the nature of the classroom as well. Uh, will, will there be enough teachers for smaller classes and enough classes for the students since Mendez is already crowded? What I can tell you is um, through the feasibility study where um, you know, Dr. Cairo and I went and with our admin team and uh, maintenance and facilities, we went to the classrooms and set them up based on the number of kids in each classroom. So we took our largest groups that we knew uh, would exist. So say 25 kids in a class at Mendez. Yes, we can set it up. Uh, and, and have the three foot physical distancing. I'm not comfortable with that. Um, and, but it can be done, um, even given the limitations, the, the way you design the room. Education, for this year anyway, will not look the same. Uh, the students will be in desks and in rows. Uh, they will not be at tables. They will not be in, on circles and, or in circles or four to a table. And, because that we can't get the physical distancing required. Um, but yes, there's enough 
um, we have enough space. The teaching is a good question, or do we have enough educators? And again, it will depend on the, the model we choose. Um, and there, there are models where, yes, we will have enough teachers. Um, but again, that and there are models that would require us to have more teachers. But that being said, that's the conversation we're having um, and will continue to have with our, uh, with our local unions. Um, will there be any exec exceptions to the rule that kids cannot go on different buses if parents cannot be home in cases of hybrid or different school schedule? Transportation is really tricky right now. Um, in my last survey, I, I had mentioned that and asked the question, do you require or will you take transportation? We have to get this number figured out. Right now, our buses are 74 students on a bus. But with that model and under the current guidelines, we can only fit uh, 27 students on the bus. I don't know how we're going to handle that. Um, there, first and foremost, there are not enough buses in Massachusetts to double the fleet size uh, of every school district because that because that is what you would need. Um, you know, we spend between seventy and eighty thousand dollars a bus. Uh, we'd have to add another one point two million dollars probably to our budget for transportation. Um, and yet, we did ask specifically that question to our transportation company, and they said, "Jim, we don't have the buses, nor do we have the drivers." So. Don't you don't even think about that. We've got to figure out a way to, to, to work with within the model we have. And by law, we only have to we only have to transport K through six students. Um, and, you know, that's the, the school district understands and I understand that that is not how we want to approach things. Um, many of our, our most vulnerable students and, uh, you know, wouldn't come to school unless we transported them. And if we only strictly stick to the, uh, the legal uh, requirements of a district, we're going to uh, create more inequity across the, the district. Um, and sorry for my, my uh, alarm, my clock going off in the background. Um, so, so those are considerations that, that were taken into place. And again, waiting for transportation guidelines from the state uh, who, and the Department of Ed is working with the transportation companies around um, the Commonwealth. We do not own our buses. We, we pay, we're a vendor. And so the cleaning protocols, the, the drivers, the, um, they're working with that, their processes with the state uh, Department of Ed. Um, and, you know, we want to make sure everyone's going to be safe and, 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 uh, what we do know is all students will be required to wear masks on buses um, to and from school. They'll be facing forward. Uh, the question is, is it in every other seat or can you sit a kid on, on the window uh, of an aisle and then a kid on the edge of, of a seat and alternate that so you create more space. Those are the things that we're continually looking at. Um, I was wondering how pods of 10 or so students would work in the high school where kids have so many different classes. That's a great question and that's, um, something we're looking at, right? It's, we talk about cohorts and cohorts are just small groups of, of, of students together. Uh, but when you get to the high school and even the middle school uh, where there's leveling in, uh, in certain um, subject areas like math, it's really challenging. As a high school, former high school principal uh, and someone who spent a lot of time and, and dives deeply into scheduling because it's something I actually enjoy, um, it's a real, it's a challenge. I think the hybrid model is the most challenging of all models, um, especially with a rotating schedule, like at the high school where you have five classes, you, know, you have seven, but you have five and you drop two every day. So we've got to think differently. Uh, what does that look like? Can we find a model that will work for this year um, where kids are in school, um, limited numbers in classrooms for, so everyone's healthy and safe, but they're getting all their classes. Um, one of the things that, that keeps coming up with, uh, with superintendents and assistant superintendents is, uh, the time on learning, right? Um, 180 school days versus and 990 hours of learning for the high school level. Um, what does that look like? Can we, can we have some flexibility there? Um, and we've been asking the commissioner for that flexibility. 
because what we need to do is we need to build a schedule that, that people are safe uh, and, and in an environment that keeps them safe and, and mitigates and reduces the risk of COVID uh, within our schools and our walls and our community. Uh, what is the procedure when a child gets sick? Um, really good question. And I know it's on this, on the board as well. That is still under development. Uh, again, Audrey LaCroix, our head nurse, um, is working with all of the nurses in our buildings. And, and I want to state, we're very fortunate. Our, our school committee has invested in um, a number of areas over the years. One is our counseling staff. We have a guidance counselor um, for every grade level. Um, which is important with the social emotional component of this. Um, secondly, we have nurses and we have one and a half nurses in every building. Uh, and I say one and a half because we have some who work part-time in one building and in, in another. And we have decided that the nursing staff, uh, the health professionals um, who are the experts will develop and create plans with uh, accordance to the the, the Board of Health, uh, the Department of Public Health, and um, our school physician, Dr. Charter. And Audrey LaCroix has done a phenomenal job, and she and the nurses are pulling these plans together. Uh, I can give an example of, of one of the requirements that came out of the initial guidance, and that's creating these isolation rooms, if you will. So if, if someone, uh, a student, comes down with uh, symptoms of, of COVID, what do we do? And so in each building, we have overtaken, if not um, created, uh, isolation rooms uh, for students. So instead of the main health room, which is um, where all kids would go, we will now uh, meet kids outside of, uh, of the health office. And then if, if they're identified as having specific um, symptoms, they either go into the general health room uh, and or uh, the isolation room. Uh, I can give two two prime examples. Um, you know, two of my principals. Um, you know, Sarah uh, at at the Pittaway School, um, Sarah Davidson, and and Pete Regan uh, at the at the Warren School. They no longer have offices. I took their offices away because they were attached to the nurse's office, um, and and we actually physically uh, created um, uh, an entryway, a doorway in between those offices. Um, at the Pittaway School. Uh, the nurse's office was right against the, the Sarah's office. So we've been able to, to shift folks around uh, in order to, to meet this requirement. Pete Regan's office is right next to the, the health office. Well, Mr. Regan, you know, we, we had to take over his office. Uh, the high school suite has a suite, which we're able to work with as and similar to um, the middle school where there's a, an office directly off from um, the nurse's office. We're, we're, we're taking that from, a, um, from one of our service providers uh, and finding new space for them. Um, so we're identifying areas where we can uh, meet all of the requirements and feel really comfortable with that. Um, will the child be kept in a separate room until the parent arrives? The answer is yes. Um, if the parent can't, will the child be returned? If, if a student is identified and we feel that they need to go home, uh, we need to have protocols in place where families come. Kids are not going to stay in the school. Um, we have to make sure and find a way to get those kids um, away home uh, and out of the buildings. Um, what happens to any students who are required to stay home for a longer period of time, a, a, the 14 day quarantine? Will there be a way of them for them to attend school remotely during that period? Yeah, so that's one of the things, um, one of the, the, the models and things that we're looking at is how do we keep the remote component um, in alignment with in-class learning and, and how challenging might that be? At grade levels, it might be, if it's an elementary and say you have a, a third grade teacher who is only teaching remotely, that's probably easy to, to, to shift because we're teaching the same materials. At the high school, it might be very different um, and we'll have to find ways to do that. We have had at the middle and high school, we have contracted with vendors to provide um, remote learning uh, for students who have been out for extended periods of time, whether it's uh, for illness. Um, you know, some families took vacations and we had to catch them up. So we've been able to, to contract with contract with outside agencies to assist in that. Uh, and we'll continue to look at that. Um, in terms of if, 
you know, this will be a question that comes up. Uh, what happens if, if we have a case in the school system? Um, which it's inevitable. I want to be clear that, you know, over a course of time, it, it, the likelihood that it occurring um, while remote can happen and, and probably will happen. And what are our protocols going to be? And again, we're taking the guidance of, of the, the Department of Public Health, the local Board of Health, our nurses, uh, as well as uh, keeping in mind the safety of all children, families, and staff, and how we approach it. Um, and those guidelines will be coming out with our um, plan on uh, in August. Um, what is the procedure when a staff uh, test positive for COVID? I just I mentioned that. How will we protect the teachers, um, uh, custodians, support staff, etc.? Um, we're going to do our best uh, to ensure that that we have our protocols and our processes in place. Our physical distancing is is looked at uh, and that we are uh, ensuring um, we can do everything we can as a school district um, to keep folks safe. Um, and it will have to be fluid. Uh, it, it, everything is, it, it, as the cases rise or go down, I mean, we have to be thoughtful and flexible. And that's really hard for us as educators. Um, and, I, you know, it, it's, we're, we're used to routine. Right now it's July 15th uh, or 16th. I know what I would be doing as a teacher right now. I mean, I lesson planning, getting ready for uh, the first week of, of school to come. So uh, it's, it's very different, the, the, the thought process right now. Excuse me. So um, we're, we're certainly um, looking at those procedures. <clears throat> Will there be seasonably appropriate outdoor education in the plan? Absolutely. That is one of the, the things that um, uh, the Department of Ed has asked us to really highly consider is what do we use for outdoor space? Uh, how do we get kids outside? Uh, listen, if we're asking kids to wear masks, we have to have mandatory mask breaks um, where we get kids outside and they can physically distance, get their mask off, get some fresh air. Um, I, we can't be concerned with making the, if a, if a class is 64 minutes long and you're a teacher who's accustomed to, I'm gonna work for those 64 minutes and deliver education, we have to be flexible. So it might be that 64 minute class is now going to be 48 and we're gonna take and stagger how we get outside. And uh, so other groups aren't out there and we're not you know, cross pollinating if you will. So they can get their masks off so they can get some fresh air. Um, it's a long time to ask. I would ask right now, families start working with your children to, to wear masks. Uh, hopefully they are and practice with them on. Um, you know, I know we're doing it with my own two children. Put it on when we go out. Uh, wear it around the house. Get used to wearing it. Um, and and we're finding in our our summer programming um, that kids are more adaptable than we are as adults. Um, and and we just need to you know reinforce and encourage and and uh, do our part as educators as well as parents. Um, so so we all stay healthy and safe. Um, has building ventilation assessment been completed? Uh, how often will air filters in the ventilation system be changed? Um, so really good questions because air control and air quality is, is one of the most important uh, factors in, in mitigating um, any of the virus in terms of the droplets and the movement of droplets and things of that nature. So we um, have a strong program uh, with our facilities and maintenance uh, where Filters uh, in our systems are, are changed with accordance to all guidelines, uh, so it's quarterly. Um, we are in the process still of testing all of our, our HVAC systems uh, and modifying and adjusting them before school begins. So we have we have rooftop units, uh, air handlers, we have some electronic control systems. Um, all of those are being analyzed. And as of right now, I spoke with my facilities uh, manager this morning. Um, and and we believe we're in really good shape um, and we're identifying any areas that need to be uh, fixed. Uh, we're identifying any areas that need to be replaced. Um, but that being said, um, you know, opening windows in the classrooms, getting some more airflow, things of that nature um, will be critically important. We are certainly looking at um, certain filters to have in rooms with less air quality or in terms of the movement of air within a specific area. 
there are requirements for um, nursing uh, in isolation rooms to have a, a different type of system. So airflow uh, doesn't move the um, back into, uh, say that if you're attaching the isolation room to the general room, that that airflow doesn't come back in. So we will continue to look at um, um, that as well. Um, we're, we're reviewing all of our, um, you know, looking at all the windows and the screens and making sure they're repaired. And um, those are things that are, um, that are ongoing and will continue to be ongoing. And, and part of it is when it's not reported, um, you know, it's always interesting when you've got, we have five school buildings, um, you know, hundreds and hundreds of classrooms um, and some teachers never open their windows and we don't know if they work. So, so we're in the process of, of, of doing that ourselves. Um, last question on here before I get to the Q and A's, um, how much of the country, with much of the country still seeing so much COVID-19, how do we know someone won't bring it to this area? We don't, um, I, I am a straight person. I think many of you have gotten to know me over the years, uh, starting my, I don't know, my 11th year now um, here in Ashland and seventh as superintendent. And I'm gonna give you a straight answer. We don't know. Um, we have to do our best with, with, within our own community. Uh, we have to be thoughtful. Uh, we have to take this seriously. And if that means requiring our students to wear masks and our families to wear masks uh, in our buildings, on the buses, uh, into physical distance, um, we will do our part within the school system. But the greater um, piece to me is what are folks doing outside of the school system? I can't control uh, the interactions between families, uh, the getting together for pool parties. I can't control um, you know, when you're playing youth sports. And, and I know youth sports are allowed to occur right now, but are folks taking the protocols seriously and enacting them? Um, that's how we will reduce and mitigate any risk to further to, to our students and our staff uh, is if everyone takes this seriously um, and, and does their part. Uh, again, I, I, to, I don't want to, I'm totally not about making this a, um, a political stand on any way, shape or form. My job is to make sure that uh, we can educate your children in a healthy and safe environment with healthy and safe uh, educators. Uh, and that's my first priority. Um, and we will find the model that does that. Um, hopefully the best. Okay. I've spoken a lot for 43 minutes, but I want to get to the questions that are on the Q and A. Uh, and thank you, Mr. Kyra for, for, you know, going through the questions and hopefully dismissing some as we've answered them. And I will see if I can get through these, um, for families. Um, Heidi Hansen, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you and all administrators for hard work. Uh, we appreciate your time. Um, Thank you. Um, that's all I can say is thank you. Um, people are working really hard. Uh, if the one thing I can I can stress is that uh, it, this is a summer unlike any other for for teachers, um, paraprofessionals, nurses, administrators. Um, usually we get a little bit of downtime. Um, this is a non downtime summer for many of us, and hasn't you know we haven't really had much since March. Uh, uh, we began thinking about what school looks like um, then for the fall. Um, so we'll, we'll see. Will the children be staying in one classroom the whole day, meaning all classes and eating breakfast and lunch in the classroom uh, that they will be in? So good question. And again, I think it will depend upon grade level um, because you can't, at the high school, when we're talking about um, cohorting kids, there are different levels of classes from college prep, honors, and advanced placement. So kids are intermingled just by nature of of their grade levels uh, and their course levels. So I, it's, it's near impossible at, at those levels. To the extent possible, absolutely. We wanna keep as many kids together as we can. Uh, as for eating lunch um, together in a classroom, I am really struggling with that as is my nutrition services individual, uh, Lisa Bowden. Um, and sorry, I didn't mean individual director, but uh, you know, it, it's, it's one of those things where kids have to take the masks off to eat. And, th and I, part of the three foot, six foot thing started bothering me because if we're gonna have three feet of space in a classroom and you're allowing them to eat and they have to take their masks off, 
Now, what the, the initial guidance was six feet, take your mask off to eat. It doesn't work in a three foot, right? Um, but then who's going to clean the classroom? Who's going to ensure that uh, the classrooms are, are sanitized and ready to go after lunch is over so they can teach? Um, what does lunch look like? Are we, we can't serve the traditional buffet line. Um, are we going to figure out a way to ask families what they want for lunch and, and, and do grab and go lunches uh, like we've done this summer for, for some families? Um, those are questions that we're still asking. Uh, I certainly think um, we will be creative, uh, but we need to be six feet apart so folks can take their masks off to eat. Um, the traditional lunch tables don't work. Uh, you can probably get four kids to a table versus the 14 that you could get now or 12. Um, so uh, lunches are a challenge. Um, will there be any additional consideration for children with special needs? Uh, absolutely. Uh, Kathy Silva, our Director of Student Services, uh, is working with building principals as well um, to determine how we're going to provide services. This is a, this is a, a really uh, interesting um, time. And I, I've mentioned this before. My, I have a child uh, who's on an IEP um, for speech uh, and, and reading. And he's not necessarily getting the services he, uh, you know, according to his IEP. Uh, but we've got to find a way to make it work within the structure of the building as well. We want inclusive opportunities for our kids. We want to make sure that, um, you know, it, we have a lot of push in and pull outs. And the pullouts scare me a little bit when teachers are pulling kids from different classrooms and bringing in kids from different classrooms and they may be in small group models. Um, now, what, what, what are we doing in terms of spreading um, the potential of, of COVID uh, into different uh, cohorts? Um, but we will again follow the guidance from the state and, uh, and see where that lands. Uh, I know Kathy has worked uh, hard on uh, reviewing and, and identifying gaps that the state has provided her. Uh, and, and again, we will uh, do what we can. How will substitutes be handled if a teacher had to be quarantined? Typically subs are multiple school classrooms, right? Uh, with, will all kids in contact also need to be quarantined and others in the family? Uh, we will rely on uh, guidance from the Department of Public Health and the local Board of Health with regard to contact tracing, uh, quarantining, and um, whether we close down classrooms or schools. Uh, that is not really my strength in terms of the public health component of how we will approach it. What I will say is substitutes. Um, we're gonna have to identify substitutes for only specific buildings. Uh, we will not be allowing, um, or my recommendation will be not to allow parent volunteers uh, into classrooms this year. Uh, we have to re and or field trips uh, for, for classes outside of the buildings. We need to make sure that we are reducing any potential risk to our um, to our students and our and our families and our educators, um, and and all of those things are being discussed. Um, any talk of altering the school calendar if they can't reopen due to public health, delaying the start, changing the schedule? Yeah, good question. And and we will be looking at our calendar again. I've already um, we've already changed it a number of times because if you remember, uh, the Boston Marathon was moved to September 14th, and they canceled that. Um, there is conversation at the state level where we're, um, and I'm, I'm a proponent of this and I'm, a, you know, an advocate that, that we come back as educators um, earlier than, than, our stat, than our students do. So for instance, we're required to have 180 school days. I would love to see them reduce that at least to 177, if not 175 days. Uh, where we use the additional days for professional development uh, with our teaching staff uh, for a number of reasons. One, uh, to ensure that our staff, when, when and if we're in a remote or a hybrid set um, uh, time period or model, that they have the skill set um, all on the same platform, whether it's Google Classroom, Google Meets, uh, that we have the skill set where our educators can use those systems. Uh, secondly, uh, I think it's important that, that we are training and, and teaching uh, the protocols and processes we need to continue to clean, uh, identifying of symptoms uh, within our classroom, uh, what it looks like if, if students are wearing masks or not wearing masks, how do, you, you know, how do you get to the bathroom, the elementary students. There's a lot of training and a lot of, of um, 
practices that will need to be rewired within our own minds as educators uh, in how we approach something. Um, so I'm hoping they're willing to change the calendar uh, and adjust the days. Uh, as many of you know, I advocated at the beginning, um, this is back in March, uh, for them to cancel MCAS for next, for next year, uh, which they have yet to do. Um, because I think those are additional days we could use for learning um, and time on learning. Uh, whether we're in a, a full session or a remote, I, I just don't think it's uh, appropriate. Um, <laughs> Sue Levine, I agree. Uh, not a question, but there's no way schools can make these decisions and be ready in 10 days. Um, here's, the, here's the thing. We've been working on this for a long time. Uh, and, and while we don't have all of the answers, we have a framework that we've been working on. You know, I had a district-wide framework uh, committee of about 40 parents, teachers, health officials, et cetera. And so we started outlining a, a framework that we need to at least be thinking about. And now the schools are using that framework. So we're hoping we can take and plug and play some of this stuff into that framework. Uh, and then we'll be uh, in good shape. Yes, it's gonna be a lot of work. There'll be sleepless nights through uh, August 10th. Um, but again, as long as we're focusing on the health and well-being of our kids and our faculty and staff, um, whatever plan we put forth, um, and even if it doesn't fall in alignment with uh, some of the things that the Department of Ed is asking for, I'm going to feel comfortable with, and, and I hope the community feels comfortable with thinking about it. Again, from day one, I talked about this being a public health concern, and that's what it is, and we need to focus continually on that. With a goal of three feet, six feet apart in a classroom, what does the equal for a number of students in a class on average? Is that 10 students? Good question, and it, uh, and it, I always wish I could give concrete answers. If it's three feet, there are high school classes, current classes that have 28 kids in a class. There are middle school teams that have 28 kids in say a history class. We can make that work. So at, with 28 kids, you reduce it. And I'm just gonna give the overview. If you reduce it to three feet or to six feet or increase it, however you wanna look at it, it's 14 kids, much more manageable, uh, much more, um, in my mind, healthy and safe. Um, but at the elementary levels, even at three to four feet, uh, we can get, you know, our class sizes are anywhere between, um, at, at Warren, anywhere between 18 and, and 22. We might be able to get all of the kids in with, you know, close to six feet of distance. Um, so each building in the makeup of their classrooms is going to be, um, is what has to be evaluated. Uh, can you explain the position of the teachers union regarding reopening? Uh, I, I touched on that at the beginning. Um, I, I think the, the Massachusetts Teachers Association, the Boston Teachers um, Union and the American Federation of Teachers, the three main unions uh, in Massachusetts are in negotiations at the state level with the Department of Education and the Commissioner of Education. Um, they are working through many of the, the challenges they see. The, um, the unions have asked locals, including Ashland, uh, to bargain certain things. Um, and, I, and I don't want to get into those specific things um, because they would be bargained um, topic, bargaining topics. But I will say this. I think we are all in agreement that we want to create uh, a safe and healthy environment. All educators want to see their kids. They believe teaching kids in person is the right thing and what we need to do, but it can't come at a cost of, of creating a, a greater health risk. And however we can mitigate that and whatever we can do locally to bargain, to ensure that we're doing the best we can for our families and our kids, um, you know, that's what we need to do. And we will continue to do that. I'm very fortunate um, that the, the relationship I have with our local union and, and Michelle Smith, who is our president, um, we work hard to make sure that we're doing right by kids and families and our educators. Um, so, uh, you know, yes, if you read the Boston Globe and uh, the unions have, unions have their stance saying, let's slow down, let's phase this in, um, I get it. Uh, and I think there has to be a, a combination of those things that we consider. Uh, and that's what we'll do locally. Uh, if we're on a hybrid model, will you ensure that siblings will be on the same schedule, even in different schools? That's absolutely our goal, uh, is to, to make sure that our siblings um, are uh, on the same schedule. Um, and, 
and we do recognize the fact that um, we have blended families and we've talked a lot about that as an admin team. So making sure that, that we try not to lose sight of the fact that someone might have uh, two different last names and, and if you had cohorted by uh, names that, you, that we can match and marry those up. Um, do we have enough custodial staff and equipment for the high level clean and disinfectant of rooms that needs to frequently take place? Uh, the answer is uh, we could always use more. Um, but we will end up having to potentially contract outside services to, to assist with some of the deeper cleaning. We've, we've invested in uh, a lot of um, uh, new uh, tools to help us with the cleaning, uh, the sprayers that go into the rooms and disinfect. That's part of scheduling as well. Um, you know, if it's a hybrid model, I'm just giving an example. I'm not saying this is what we're doing, uh, but I won't, so I want to be clear there. But if we have a you know, a two day, you know, one day in between a, a Wednesday uh, off where it's just remote and people can be home, or if it's um, an opportunity to, to shut the building down, maybe it's a Friday and we do a really deep, thorough cleaning. And now no one's in our schools for three days or for 24 hours that helps us with, with ensuring um, the disinfecting occurs and we can utilize the staff that we have. Um, I'm currently registered for the bus, but can absolutely drive my kids. Is there a way people can rescind their registration so you can start? Yeah, uh, good question. I, I would ask that if, uh, and I put this out in the email and it, and it was a long email last week and it may have gotten lost. Um, if, if you don't wanna take the bus or at this point in time, you're saying, hey, I, you know, I can drive my kids. I'm, I'm willing to do that if it frees up spots for the kids who need it. Uh, yes, uh, send an email. Uh, or reach out to the transportation office, Aaron Palini, uh, and we will pull you off the list in that way. Uh, and then we'll we'll work towards the refunding if, if your check has already been cashed, et cetera. Um, and I will I will send that out in another message this week. But absolutely, if you know if if you're comfortable doing that, uh, we would um, we would appreciate that uh, for now. Um, it might cause us some some agita <laughs> with regard to. Uh, drop off and pick up in our schools, but um, but limiting um, the the necessity to have the buses um, and and finding um, the um, finding ways to to get kids to school would would be helpful for sure. Uh, our working groups, including parents and children, uh, yes, uh, Ashpack uh, has been um, on the working group and special education teachers, and um, so. Um, yes. Uh, will you be providing aftercare in the schools? Now, I want to be clear, the Ashland Public Schools don't provide aftercare or before care, with the exception of our extended day program. EDP will, will absolutely be uh, running. Uh, and we're working, and Ms. Melissa is working on uh, the guidelines that she needs to follow uh, for um, aftercare. We will be working with our champions program, the YMCA, in reaching out to other uh, local um, care programs to help, again, um, minimize any uh, disruption this is going to have on working families. Uh, we get that this is going to cause, um, you know, some some concern for families, no matter what model we choose, and and folks want to get back to work and need to get back to work. But again, I, I need to emphasize that we uh, are, are focused on making sure that our environment is um, healthy and safe for our faculty, staff, students, and, and educators across the board. Um, and so, so that being said, we will do the best we can um, and we will try to connect folks. But right now, the, the Early Education um, Commission is, has different standards than um, that they have to follow in terms of the number of kids that they can allow in uh, to programs and the staffing ratio and things of that nature. So we are working through that. Thank you for the unspeakable hard work that has been ongoing. More curious how we re remote scenario could be made more synchronous. Um, so I, I agree. I think the synchronous learning, uh, so in person live, needs to be ramped up uh, for sure. Uh, again, that's a question that we will be uh, navigating uh, with regard to uh, our types of programs that we could potentially offer uh, to families. Um, I, I struggle, so I, I've worked through numerous scenarios with my wife who is a high school teacher and who teaches five, 
five different sections from advanced placement Spanish down to Spanish two. And I said, hey, Jen, what does this look like if we run this type of model uh, where you're teaching half the kids, but then you've got to half the kids at home? How does that work? How much more work is that? And, it's, and think about it. If you're doing an online and a uh, in-person, potentially it could be double, right? Uh, unless we find a way to maybe stream what they're, they're doing in the classroom. Um, I will tell you right now that that's a bargaining topic that would have to be discussed with filming uh, live film, filming in the classroom. Uh, secondly, it certainly changes the dynamic of a classroom. Uh, thirdly, uh, we've been looking for cameras uh, to ensure that we have enough cameras that we could even do that. Um, so there are tremendous costs associated with that and hiring of staff if we can't do that, who are dedicated just to um, the remote learning. I, I think we're more uh, the flexibility uh, of, of the younger grades um, will be more evident to families than the uh, the flexibility of, of a high school, for instance, again, because there are seven classes, uh, four different um, potential levels of, of classing uh, as well. So uh, will there be any sports or extracurricular activities this fall? I can tell you that the MIAA uh, and the, um, uh, d the Department of Education are working towards uh, what it will look like. I, I would not wanna say one way or the other. Uh, my gut tells me, if there is, it's going to look very different. Um, and what I'm struggling with internally in my own mind is that we're working hard at not uh, mixing kids in classrooms, but yet we're saying it's, it's okay for you to go and um, have 22 kids um, then mix from different cohorts uh, on, a, on a soccer pitch. Um, I'm just struggling internally with that. I'm not saying it's not the right thing to do. I understand that kids are out there right now with youth programs and playing baseball and softball. What I'm hearing at the state level, uh, and this is a statewide decision, it will not be an Ashland decision about sports, um, is uh, that if sports do occur, they're thinking of shortening seasons uh, and maybe potentially having flip-flopping some of the, the sports so there are less contact sports uh, in the fall. Uh, golf, for instance, or cross country, or um, uh, you know, baseball or softball, which are occurring right now. So that's at the, uh, in the MIA's hands and we will follow their lead um, when that comes out. Can you explain if the state is protecting the schools from coronavirus related lawsuits, uh, if they take reasonable precautions, but a student got sick anyway? Great question. And I don't have an answer for that. That is for sure. Um, I'm hesitant to, to go down the road of, of of uh, legal uh, challenges and or uh, lawsuits. And we will be continually um, keeping, our, uh, keeping our firm, um, our law firm our, who, who we have hired, the school committee has hired uh, in the loop on all decisions that we make. Um, and, and that's, you know, that's, we're gonna see some stuff. Uh, I, I don't know what it's gonna look like, uh, but I want to reiterate, uh, we're all taking a risk every day we walk into the grocery store um, in contracting uh, COVID. Um, and um, there will be continued risk, uh, risk of catching the flu, risk of, of, of anything that we um, partake in outside of just sitting in our house. Um, and, I'm, and I'm hoping that um, common sense uh, law prevails on many of this stuff. How will HS schedule rotations likely work if it's supposed to be small groups? Uh, how will this impact seniors who will be applying to colleges in terms of academics? Uh, good question. And again, the high school working group is working on, on those types of, of questions. Uh, what I can say is the colleges and universities are, are in the loop of what we're doing uh, in Massachusetts and in other states with regard to um, education. And what I will say is... Um, they understand uh, that it's going to look different. Uh, the application, the students' applications are going to look differently than they have in the past. And um, our, our counseling staff is phenomenal and they will continue to work with uh, our students and our families to ensure that um, you know, students are, uh, if they're applying to college or applying to the right colleges, are uh, looking at their transcripts appropriately and that we are, it's our obligation to connect with those universities and colleges to say, this is what we did because of 
uh, COVID-19. Um, you know, yesterday I was listening to um, Douglas Brinkley, who's a professor at Rice University and uh, a presidential historian, and, and he was given a, a, a keynote speech yesterday. And, and, and what he talked about was being in the COVID era and that kids are going to be identified. And, um, and I think colleges and universities is, will understand that as well. Uh, we're all in it uh, together. Um, colleges and universities are not having all their kids back uh, on campus um, either. Um, they're, they're bringing some cohorts in, uh, sort of what we're thinking about at, at the public schools. Um, are you providing PPE such as masks to the student? So good question. We will have masks on hand. The expectation from the Department of Ed is that all families will provide a mask to their own children. Um, but we will have, uh, we've purchased over $100,000 of, of PPE equipment, uh, includes masks, uh, face shields, um, gowns, uh, you know, uh, protective gear for our, for our staffing, um, and anything that is, um, you know, we have some, some teaching staff, for instance, that, that have to be in close proximity to our kids. And we want to make sure that they're in a position to um, stay healthy and safe. Um, how the health data versus sentiment won't drive these decisions. Um, it's a good question. I, how do we interpret the health data? Um, you know, the numbers look great in Massachusetts, right? Um, I certainly think if, if we were just to look at yesterday alone, I think there were 150 new cases in the state of Massachusetts. Um, but does that mean um, we should be opening schools um, full time because of that? I don't think so. When, you know, I, I posed this question recently to a neighbor uh, who's got a, a seventh grade daughter and I said, and, and she works for a, um, she works for a company in Boston. And I said, I said to her, I said, do you think when you go back to work, if you go back to work, that of your 30 employees that you're going to get uh, 18 of you in a, in a room to have a meeting? And she said, Jim, probably not for a long time. Uh, and I said, well, why if the, if the data is clear and that, that you can do this? And, and she said, well, we don't know if it's 100% clear. We don't know and we don't wanna risk uh, having this. And I, and I said, well, so, and this was a parent who was really advocating to push all 25, 30 kids back in the classroom said, but you're willing to risk that with kids. Uh, and yes, I get the fact that some of the data shows that kids are at less susceptible and at risk, but are you willing to have 25 students, an adult um, in mass sitting in the classroom three feet apart for a few hours on end? Um, and it just made, made her think a little bit differently uh, in terms of pausing for a moment. I didn't say it, it swayed her mind. I'm just saying it made her think like, okay, you're right. I, we're not asking um, our, our own selves and our own employees to do this. Um, so how do we, how do we approach that? Um, do I wish, uh, Sue, to your question, do I wish we'd had more, we have more guidance or um, strict guidance, stricter guidance from the state level? I do. Um, we are on an island unto themselves in every one of our communities and it's unfortunate. Uh, that's just how I feel. Um, have you looked at or even allowed to think about <laughs> bringing back just the younger kids for in-person while keeping older kids more completely remote and maybe spreading the younger kids throughout the older buildings? Uh, yes, um, that is a consideration uh, and something has been thought about. Um, I can tell you that um, a Warren student cannot go and use the toilet probably at um, the high school uh, or the sinks, uh, which are too high. Um, there, there are a myriad of challenges within the buildings themselves that would pose uh, significant um, um, difficulties. And that, you know, just a high school is built for high school age kids. It's not built for elementary kids. Um, and, you know, that's then the transportation concerns and we, but we have considered it and we are, and I wouldn't say it's uh, off the table, but it's it certainly, um, physical limitations of our facilities uh, could prove to be way too exorbitant in terms of cost. Um, is Ashland trying to increase the amount of staff to spread out staff and students? If so, do you have the classrooms and budget to do this? Uh, the answer is we do not have the budget to do this. Um, and there, I do not see any funding coming our way to provide relief. 
for every community in the Commonwealth. Um, in terms of, you know, the, the classroom space, the only way to do a classroom to spread out students would be to, again, it's about doubling our size of number of classroom spaces that we have. And we don't, uh, we don't have that flexibility. Um, that's why, you know, I, I think we have to take a stand at some point and the school committee has to take a stance on three feet versus six feet and what is the right thing to do. Um, you know, just because we can do something doesn't mean it's the right thing to do. Um, and I know that's not going to sit well with some families. I get that. Um, but I'm trying to look at this holistically uh, from a, um, again, from a standpoint of protecting all of our our community members, our families, our students, our, our faculty and our staff um, to do that. Um, when will the final decision be made? Um, I have to have a final decision um, sent to the state on August 10th. They've asked us not to make any decisions until uh, August 10th. Um, that being said, we are, um, we are going through the process of, of working through all of the, um, the potential um, models of education. Um, July 31st, I have to present to the state um, our feasibility study of our classroom space, uh, whether or not we can fit all of our kids back in for live in-person learning. Uh, that's the first step. What will the specific cleaning equipment protocols between classes? That I'm not sure yet. That will be worked out uh, with our director of facilities and, um, and our custodial staff. And again, those are things that have to be negotiated as well. Um, believe it or not, we have uh, these contracts we have to work through uh, to, in order to make sure that um, the, um, you know, that the, the work environment, um, you know, conforms with the things that were negotiated in the past. Um, we, I, I won't state this though. Uh, we have a very flexible uh, working group and in terms of our, our staffing and, and they will do what's best for kids. Uh, in terms of masks on the kids, right now my son is wearing a gaiter rather than a mask. Will that type of mask covering be acceptable? Yeah, it is, at this point, it, what it states is a mask or face covering um, in, the, in the language. Um, we borrowed a Chromebook um, to aid to remote learning. Will that be available again to families this fall? The answer is yes, it will be. Uh, our goal is um, to invest in enough Chromebooks for every child in this district has one at the beginning of the year or very soon thereafter. Uh, we recognize the fact that we need to ensure that our families are prepared for any um, potential of remote or hybrid learning. Uh, and it needs to be in the, in the hands of, of our, our students. Uh, where, where has anyone been, where has anyone been out if people are six foot distancing? Certainly not any kids. I, Maybe a checkout is six feet, but not passing through stores. You had 61% willing to send their kids in mass, and that's without knowing you were investing, investing in a three-foot rule. Uh, no, I wrote a three-foot rule, but I had numerous families say to me, I would change my mind if it was just three feet. Uh, those same 12, oh, I didn't read the rest of that question. Um, I'm going to go back. That was too quick. Um, those same 12% that want remote most likely don't vaccinate their kids. And I, again, I'm not gonna get into the political uh, aspect of this. Um, I know that everywhere I go uh, and everything I read uh, in terms of stores um, or in public or even the governor's um, recommendation is if you're out in public, uh, mask on and six feet of space. Um, but again, I, I don't wanna get into the public uh, or the, um, the political conversation. It's not to me a political conversation. Uh, I believe that we need to be looking at um, what is best for the health reasons. And yes, I understand um, that, you know, 60% of the, the folks are saying um, we want our kids back full time. I get why. Um, and, and believe me, I want my child, if I had to answer the question, yeah, I want my child to go back. Um, but am I willing to send them back? That's a different question. And I, part of it was just gauging that, um, that question. Um, thinking outside the box, if some colleges are doing, uh, could you bring the freshmen and seniors back in person in the fall and sophomore juniors remote and switch the groups out different times throughout the year? Again, all of that is on the board. Uh, we have to meet certain um, requirements uh, and 
in terms of our hours and learning, but also with what staffing we have. And we've got to be thoughtful of, of that. Um, and again, it's very different at the high school with, it, it's one thing, colleges and universities, freshmen and sophomores typically have certain you know, professors. Our, our teachers teach all levels. So freshmen through seniors. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what, um, what we come up with. Warren used to have a half-day curriculum. Could this be adopted as a hybrid model it, um, for all schools? It would also allow to have enough buses to transport children as well. Yeah, we're looking at that as well. It's a good question. Um, we used to have just half-day uh, at Warren for K, um, and you know we're we're certainly considering it. We still have curriculum that we need to cover um, through the high school age, and we want to make sure. And especially with MCAS still on the table, uh, we have to make sure that we are. Um, you know, getting through as much curriculum as possible with our students going to college, et cetera. Um, will preschool families still have to pay tuition for remote learning periods? Uh, that is in the conversation right now, whether or not remote learning is going to occur at preschool. Um, and we will continue to investigate that. Um, again, preschool is not mandated only for, um, for a certain um, segment of our population. Um, and uh, while it's used for a lot of families as uh, you know, you know, childcare as well. Uh, we wanna make sure that uh, if we're charging folks that, that we do it um, in good conscience and in, uh, inappropriately. So we are, we are investigating that uh, um, right now. Colleges are saying remote learning for the fall. Like the, uh, like the high schools, college students are in different classes throughout the days. Are they offering to make their remote learning platforms available to Massachusetts of public schools? Are their platforms more robust than Zoom, WebEx? Yeah. Uh, good question. And the state is actually looking at uh, developing and, and contracting with a uh, outside agency for remote learning that all school districts could um, could utilize. Um, the college and universities, um, you know, aren't necessarily looking at specific platforms. Uh, at least some of the, the professors I know, um, they're they're using you know they're using Zoom. There, but but there's a lot of those are lecture based, and and it's not always the same at the um, at the, at the high school and the elementary levels. Um, thank you for your brief up. You're welcome. Stay tuned for more. Uh, how much have you kept in touch with other towns and cities in Massachusetts in regards to their plans, concerns, and other considerations? Uh, don't delete this yet, Mr. Kyra. Uh, every day, uh, we speak every single day, the superintendents of, of at least this region, um, if not uh, across the state. Um, I can tell you that there's not a day that goes by I'm not in contact with Medway, Holliston, Hopkinton, Dover, Sherburne, um, Framingham, uh, Franklin, uh, all the surrounding towns. We speak every single day. We all have the same concerns. Um, and, and that is um, something that, you know, we have families coming from, you know, teachers who come from Medway or Holliston and Hopkinton. They, they live in those towns and they work here. Um, so we know the concerns that exist in Ashland exist in, in Hopkinton. But I do want to state too that all of our communities have a little bit of nuance, right? So we have to consider that within Ashland and we have to consider that within uh, the Metro West area. So we'll continue to do that. Um, I am grateful that you're focused on Ashland. Thank you, that's my job. <laughs> but there seems to be value in not reinventing any wheels and getting some great ideas from other schools. Uh, that's exactly what we're doing, right? No one is, again, I wanna repeat this because I think there's, there's always this notion that we work independently and without um, taking in uh, advice and or um, you know, in collaboration with other districts or uh, communities. And that's the furthest thing from the truth. Uh, we are not reinventing the wheel. Uh, we are actually trying to design programs that are consistent across our districts uh, and as much as we can. Uh, because what we want to make sure is that if we've got employees who are working in one district that that and they, and they have children, that those children are taken care of while they can work in another district and as an educator. It, it, th there are some real life concerns there as well uh, for educators. Uh, how do we, you know, how do we uh, teach in one district while our kids live in another and go to school in another? And, and if, if that district looks totally different than our district, what do we do and how do we approach this? Um, so uh, we absolutely are, are partnering with other districts. Um, what is my opinion on school reopening? Should schools reopen in the absence of a vaccine? 
uh, please support your answer with evidence. Uh, well, opinions uh, aren't necessarily uh, directly related to evidence. <laughs> so um, my opinion is I think we need to have school reopened. In what form? I don't know. Um, that is why we're having this conversation um, across the district, across the state, and across the country. Um, you know, I, I think we've been smart as a uh, as a state and a community in mitigating uh, the spread of COVID. But I don't want to be short sighted to think that it's not going to happen uh, in terms of a spike. It's happening across the country, um, all around. Uh, California is a, a state that I look at and say they were on lockdown early. They had some really strong uh, mandates, and um, but yet they're seeing tremendous rise as well. Um, it'll be interesting, and I think part of the reason why the commissioner has not asked us to uh, present plans until August, um, they've just really started reopening um, the state um, back in uh, right before, right after Memorial Day weekend. So we're talking four to six weeks and to see what occurs with any potential spikes before making decisions. That's the data piece. I think that the state is waiting for us to, uh, to have. Um, I'm interested in how the faculty will explain, speak to the pandemic and how it's changed school to the kids themselves, especially with the younger kids. I'm all for open and honest talk, just curious how this will be framed for them based on their level of understanding. That's a great question. And it's probably a, a conversation we will have with each of our staffs. Um, we have yet to have that um, because again, faculty has been away for the summer. Um, but I'm sure they're thinking about it. I think we need to be thoughtful. Jen Culler, who is our director of social emotional learning, uh, will absolutely have uh, a strong role in, in, in creating a message that's appropriate for our kids at all levels. Um, I agree, remote learning didn't work for every family. Uh, many families have parents working full-time jobs with children who cannot work independent, agreed. Uh, what, time, what type time of learning platform can you establish to support these families? Again, those are going to be the questions we have. Um, we don't know that answer yet. Um, and it's going to look different for those families that want to keep their kids home completely. Uh, and, and that's a choice. Uh, I want to be clear. If families decide to keep their kids home, that's a choice they're making. And whatever um, model we set up is the model that we're going, you know, that they either subscribe to or, or you can homeschool. Um, but that being said, uh, if it's a hybrid or a remote, because we have to be remote, um, uh, it, it will certainly be more robust and, and we'll have to find ways to, to work with our, our families. How do you keep preschoolers three to six feet apart if they do not sit at desk? Um, good question. Uh, and I will leave that to Sarah Davidson uh, and Kathy Silva, uh, who are working through those logistics. And we do have desks uh, for preschoolers. Uh, I was actually walked through a classroom yesterday. Um, where we set, set a classroom up with desks. Um, it's not ideal. There's nothing that's going to be ideal about the school year um, or perfect about the school year. Um, the, the many hours that we've planned for this um, and have been reading and uh, looking at the data from, from other countries uh, and other states, um, uh, we're fortunate we start later in the school year. Um, uh, than, than many states. And, and we're at least able to see some of the, um, the pitfalls uh, and the successes of those states. Uh, are you looking at having some of the reading and math specialists teach a regular class to lower the number of students in classrooms? Yeah, that's also been one of the recommendations um, at the state level. And we are looking at all of those, um, you know, the potential of doing that. But what we have to remember is the reading and math specialists do have very specific roles. Uh, in meeting needs of students with uh, on IEPs and 504s and remediation. So if we start taking them away, um, how do we meet the uh, our obligations there? So th those are the types of questions that we are asking um, uh, of our staff and, and our, our building principals. Just so you know, only HEPA filters are capable of filtering the virus. This is the filter that commercial airplanes use. I, I understand that. Um, and, and I'm just going back and reading through uh, I don't know the specific terms, but MERV 8 efficiency ratings, and that's what's being recommended. Uh, there, we are using, and, and again, uh, we are in dialogue um, with regard to uh, the filter systems, the window and the air quality and the flow uh, within our buildings. Um, 
And there are certain uh, limitations as to what filters can be used within our systems. Um, uh, so we will invest in, and again, part of it is our facilities folks are, are working with uh, the guidelines that, that are being recommended to them and we will continue to do that um, uh, to ensure the proper air quality. Again, but again, if you have 30 kids in a classroom, um, that's not gonna work either uh, in terms of the air quality, in terms of the size of the room and things of that nature. What about families like me who, who can't take kids to work if it goes remotely? I understand and that's why I, I said at the beginning, I don't know, uh, there, this is not going to be ideal for, for all families. Um, it's just not going to work for all families, no matter what we do. Uh, the only way I guess it works is if it's completely 100% uh, open um, and that, that all kids are in school um, all day long, um, back to a traditional setting. Uh, in a hybrid model, can I request that my children are on opposite schedules? We have limited bandwidth and they distract each other during virtual learning. Good question. And I think we would have to take the, that offline and, and have these questions um, uh, spoken, uh, you know, you know, spoken individually with families. Uh, again, uh, we want to look at potential reduction of risk, right? So um, having having two different cohorts uh, may, may be a challenge. Is there something being set up so families can donate to help the school meet the needs of the schools? We have not done that yet. Uh, we, have, we have federal funds that have come through the town um, that they are providing with us right now. So in terms of equipment, desks, um, computers, Chromebooks. We're at the point where uh, I have a meeting here in four minutes at 9.30 um, where we're talking about uh, our needs and the financial uh, needs. Um, but we're fortunate we have a great relationship with the town and they received money from the federal government that can be used for COVID related expenses. Um, can you add a question to your survey, next survey to allow the bus question to determine if you only need it before school or after school or both? You only poss possibly need it after school, but not to, yeah. Mike, can you take note of that question? And we will, we'll get that out there. If we're signed up for EDP, but, the, but are concerned about attending in the fall, can we defer to the spring? Uh, you would have to reach out specifically to Ms. Mercon Smith um, with EDP. Um, Dream Station Early Learning Center is working at developing schedules for aftercare to support working families, as well as supporting APS with the plans there. Awesome. I uh, thank Dream Station. That'll be another group that we will be reaching out to uh, for sure. Um, will students have, oh, sorry. If students are doing remote learning every other week or day, will services like OT and PT still be available in person during the remote periods? Again, um, Kathy Silva and Director of Student Services is working with our entire um, special education staff and, and uh, um, specialized services staff to, to see how we can meet the needs of our, our students and their IEPs. Uh, we'll, what happened? Okay, oh, this keeps jumping up, that's why. Uh, if a family travels out of state or is exposed to COVID directly in some way, will they be asked to keep their kids home from school for a period of time? Yeah, I mean, we can ask, but how do I track down every kid and every family who travels out of state? Um, at some point, again, as families, we have to take personal responsibility for our own actions. Um, Will students have at recess? If so, what will recess look like? Um, we are working through those guidelines as well with recess. Uh, yes, kids need to be outside and, and get recess. We need to, to identify areas that those cohorts can be together and only those cohorts. Um, and I, it's fundamental that they get um, outside uh, and do that. Can we request budget from state for adding modulars to provide additional space? Uh, understanding that staffing for the additional spaces is also an issue. We can request, funding um but what i can say is um the the feasibility study that is being done is done in such a way that that will help identify what districts need uh and how we can apply for funding uh through the state that being said i think the intent of that is the initial guidance is the state um is hoping that that all schools would be back full time um, where, where there's no additional cost. But I just don't see that happening across the Commonwealth. I just don't, uh, there are many, 
buildings and districts that can't do that. We have the space um, theoretically uh, to do this. Um, so uh, right now the, there are funds that are coming into the school and hopefully will be coming in over the next month. Again, all directly related to COVID. Um, modules are quite expensive uh, and we, there's no way we could actually get them set up in time uh, at this point uh, in the school year. Uh, when we put the Warren ones up, we started that work in May, uh, I believe, um, to get it ready for, for September. Sorry if it was covered earlier. Assuming that there will be some percent of virtual teaching, will the high school teachers be more engaged and held more accountable to truly educating the students? For example, graded homework and exams versus pass fail. Honestly, we were very underwhelmed. Um, yes, uh, short answer is yes. Uh, but again, virtual teaching may look differently um, depending upon if you're a full remote family uh, who's requesting not going back to school or a hybrid model or a teacher doing remote. Uh, can you say anything about with regard to coronavirus or, geez, I keep jumping. Uh, I'm gonna go to this question. Can you say anything with regard to coronavirus antibody testing? That is such that ideally, every occupant in the school would be virus free and less likely to spread the virus. Very complex and hard to understand, I know. Uh, not, it's not hard. Listen, we've talked about testing and how do we get testing for our, our kids and our, our teaching staff, et cetera. Um, we're not going to be considered a priority where um, everyone's gonna be entitled to that test. Um, you know, that, but that has been a question at the state level. Um, how do we ensure that uh, our, our whether it's antibodies or um, the testing occurs. I, the antibody question is, is interesting. Uh, again, there's so much data out there and, and I don't know what's um, legit and what's not sometimes when I read it. And, um, but some are saying the antibodies only last for a couple months. Um, I don't know. My high school student athlete was just contacted to attend captain's practice again next week. Is that okay? Again, you're, you're the parent. <laughs> um, uh, you have to make that decision. Um, I, I think, I don't know what they're planning on doing. Um, you know, if they're socially distanced, uh, physically distanced outside, um, there are certain regulations that have been put in place uh, at the state level uh, with regard to uh, participation in youth sports. And that's where I would start by looking at those guidelines. Um, we do not uh, captain's practices are not condoned, just so you know, from the MIA standpoint and the school standpoint, the schools, um, cap, they are not recognized as legitimate practices and or under the, the um, purview of a school system. Uh, those are, those are um, students getting together on their own. Um, will you require students to bring their own supplies and PPE? When will we notify the list? Uh, yes, we will, the, the masks are what are currently required um, uh, for all students. Um, and if there's anything more, we will let you know. When will a decision be made in fall sports? Uh, I don't, I, that I don't know. MIA is, is in charge of that. I'm hoping in the next couple of weeks. Um, maybe captain's practice shouldn't be allowed on school property. I understood, again, these are town-wide owned properties um, that are open to the public like the state park is. Um, and, and that's, you know, again, it's a tricky situation um, to, to identify uh, what we can and cannot do. And again, I, I, I'm not being flip here. Uh, I'm trying to say as, as parents, we, you know, I, it's a hard decision sometimes we make as parents, but at times we have to, and we have to say, no, I just don't feel comfortable with you doing that. Um, I get that. Um, it puts us in, um, unwinnable situations with our own kids. And, and believe me, uh, as a parent of a soon to be sophomore uh, and an eighth grader, uh, I'm living it every day myself. Okay, it's been an hour and 34 minutes. I'm so appreciative of the fact that you took some time uh, to do this uh, and to spend the morning with me. Uh, again, I, I wanna just close by saying, I, I wish I had more answers. I wish we had more directive. I wish um, we could go back to normal. Our, my teaching staff wishes they could see their kids every single day of the school year uh, and be in school with them in person. Um, but it, it may just not be a reality um, at this point in time. Uh, and, you know, and there's no guarantee that a vaccine will be ready uh, until sometime in 2021. And what does that vaccine look like? And is it going to be uh, appropriate? 
Um, and, and will it work? Uh, so I, I, I just think as patients, I'm only asking, uh, you know, as a superintendent to you as parents, I, I'm only asking for your patience and your understanding that, that we as a district have been working on plans, using guidelines, using what has been mandated specifically at the state level. There are certain things that have been mandated to us uh, that we must follow um, and that every community around us is struggling with. Uh, we will do what is best for kids. Uh, and I, I understand and, and respect the fact that we may not uh, always agree on that. And, and, I, and I mean that sincerely. Um, and you know, I, I, I think what's important is that we will make sure we have decisions that are in the best interest of, of, of our students, our faculty and staff and the health and safety of, of, of our kids. Um, and I recognize that many of them are being hurt uh, through social emotional and, uh, and they need that socialization factor. I get it, I need it. I'm a social person myself um, and, and I'm working hard at, at trying to find ways to do that while staying uh, you know, thoughtful and healthy and safe um, in my own way. So um, you know, I, I'll leave you with this. Yesterday um, celebrated a uh, hundred year uh, birthday of my wife's grandmother. Uh, where we live and, and to see the 30 people who showed up at sporadic times, understanding that, you know, she's hundred years old and wearing masks and staying away and physically uh, it was hard, but we were being thoughtful of, of how it uh, would play out for her and, and, and other folks. And, um, and that's all we're asking is let's just be thoughtful of that. And, uh, and do the best we can for our families and, and our kids and our teaching staff. So again, thank you so much. And uh, please be on the lookout for the next survey next week. Uh, oh, hold on, there may be another question here. In the future, would you consider breaking up these meetings by schools, maybe Pitaway, Warren and Mendez in one meeting? Uh, sure, um, we could. I, I think what most likely will occur is we might have the building principals do those meetings. Uh, it makes more sense once plans are in place because they'll be very building specific. Uh, it's a great suggestion. Um, and, and we can probably do that um, in, in the future for that piece. Uh, thank you, Don, for, for those kind words. Okay, well, thank you folks. And, uh, and I will be in touch.